there's a part of that prayer, um, a different part each time that kind of gets to me. Uh, today, it was uh, whether you want me full or empty. Do you ever feel empty? Do you ever feel like you, you've given all you can give and things like that? Uh, sometimes we are empty to the glory of God and filled by Him, not at the time that we would wish, but at the time he would wish, and it is always, always satisfying. So uh, here we are in this series, Believe, and we're going through the book of John, and we're allowing uh, Jesus and uh, Jesus' earliest disciples to define for us what it means to believe in Jesus. Uh, sometimes we ask everybody their opinion about what does it mean to be be to believe in Jesus, and rarely do I find people go, um, "What do you think? What do you think Scripture says? What do you think the early Christians thought? What do you think Jesus thought about that?" But the perfect place for that is the Book of John. As we've said before, John uses the word "believe" in one way or another 98 different times in his gospel. He, he rarely uses the word "faith" at all. I think he uses it one time. There, but he replaces that with the word belief and uh, or believe, and so we ought to find out what that means. And last week we actually came to a place where we got a definition. Now, before we do that, I've got some some kind of uh, stuff that we've got to talk about just real quick. I wouldn't usually do this if you're a guest. We don't usually just do this kind of thing. It's kind of like insider talk or something like that. Um, but some of you know that uh, next week is the start of October. Now. One year, or two years ago in October, we started something called the Freedom Drive. Do you remember that? Many of you have been giving to the Freedom Drive. That was to pay our debt down and pay our debt off on this building. And, and uh, so let me show you where we started at with that Freedom Drive two years ago. The Freedom Drive two years ago, our payoff was 132000 Not Not a huge amount, but for us, that's a, that's a pretty good-sized amount, right? Uh, anybody got that, that you can just kind of pitch in on it today or anything like that? No. Um, and so together, we decided, hey, let's pay that off. We don't, we don't want to be in debt, and let's get that out, uh, uh, out from over our head. And so the payoff date for that was going to be 2027, uh, so a long way still down the road. But we've been at it nearly two years, and so our payoff right now is 32000 Yeah. Yeah. And the payoff date, if we, don't, if, if we just do regular payments from now on and don't give any extra, is November of 2024. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that fantastic? Now, um, I, I bump into people all the time who see our building and go, wow, you guys must be just rife with money. And uh, you, you just must be pouring out of your ears. And I would say, wow, if it is, I need new eyes because I'm not seeing it. And it's just, it's just not that way. We try to make every dollar stretch. And in fact, one of the things we faced um, over the summer was that our building insurance... Uh, we, our, our insurance guy that we've had forever just sent us a letter and saying, um, as of October, your insurance is going up by 130%, which means our, build, our, our insurance payment per month would be as much as our building payment has been. So we've been shopping like crazy to find, fortunately, we, we think we found something that's less than it was going to be, but still more than it was last year. And so prices keep going up and that kind of thing. And we run so close, uh, run so tight, and some ministries are underfunded and things like that because uh, we, we rely on the generosity of, of, uh, of those who are committed to the mission uh, of what we do and, uh, and moving forward. So this is a big deal for us. If you're kind of an outsider, this is a big deal for us that we've all pitched in and said, hey, we don't, we don't want debt hanging over us telling us what we can do. Uh, we, we, we just decided, debt, you're not the boss of us, right? Okay. And so there it goes. Give yourself a round of applause. Wow. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Well, um, 
three weeks ago when we started this series, we said we were going to come up with a definition for belief, and it took us three weeks into it to come up with a definition of what belief means, and we came up with this, that belief is trusting loyalty. We, we trust in Jesus, that Jesus is who he says he is, and that he will do what he says he will do. We trust that what Jesus says is true about himself and about our world, and we buy into it. We are loyal to the things that Jesus says. Uh, buy into him and his way of viewing the world, his way of viewing us, uh, and that kind of thing. And so belief is not where I get to pick and choose the categories for Jesus. I allow him to tell me what his categories are, and I wrap my life around that. And so um, today, we're going to start looking at different people that came to Jesus and were challenged by who he was or something that he said or something that he did and how they faced that challenge as they wrestled with the identity of the person in front of them. This morning, we're going to look at the most famous verse in all of Scripture. And it is uh, John 3.16. We'll get there. Believe me, we'll get there. And, uh, but we also have within John chapter 3 the most famous word picture of what it means to believe and what that does for us. And so as we go through, there, now we'll skip um, some chapters here and there. You'll notice we skip chapter 2. In chapter 2, Jesus goes to a wedding and turns water into wine and, uh, and honors a couple by being at their wedding. And then uh, at, at the end of that, we see him going into the temple and he overthrows some, some tables where people were being money changers. And he, he growls at the people, get this stuff out of here. Um, quit making my father's house into a house of business or into a, uh, in, into a mercantile. And he throws them over and chases the, the animals away that are there and that kind of thing. And now, a very important person comes to see him. But he comes at night. He's undercover. And he wants to talk to Jesus. He's heard all kinds of things about Jesus. He's heard some things like this Jesus seems to do things that that are just fantastic. There's, there's word out that he casts out demons. There, there's word out that he heals people. In fact, there are folks that, uh, that have seen him do that. There are folks we can talk to that have been healed by him. There, there are other folks that say that he is the Messiah. And so, this very important person named Nicodemus comes to Jesus, but he comes at night, you see, because he's part of a group of people called the Pharisees. Now, Pharisees have more to do with what they believed than actually being a card-carrying member of a club or something like that. These were fairly conservative people who believed that uh, Israel needed to be its own country again to fully reflect the blessing of God on them. Rome uh, had, has basically enslaved Israel and, and uh, uses it for tax money to go back and, and fund all kinds of wars and all kinds of things that Israel wouldn't believe in. And the, and the Pharisees believed that if Israel, if the people of Israel would just be faithful to the righteousness that God calls us to and live right, do the right sacrifices, do the right things, um, uh, do everything that scripture tells us to do. If we could just do that again, then we would not only be living in the promised land, but living under the promise of God and be the people of God once again. So this is very important to them. Now, Jesus has many confrontations with the Pharisees over the book of John. But the interesting thing that you should know, as bad a rap as we give the Pharisees, of all the groups of people that are mentioned in the Bible, Pharisees, Essenes, uh, Sadducees, and other groups, the, if you were to lay, overlay Jesus' beliefs with the Pharisees' beliefs, there is quite a bit of overlap. It's not 100%, but Jesus most likely was himself a Pharisee. And so... 
the trouble is that he's around Pharisees all the time, and so he begins confronting them over ways in which their beliefs are not the, the, the kinds of beliefs that lead us to a relationship with God. And so the Pharisees are ticked off at Jesus. In fact, they're getting angrier and angrier with him. And later on in the, uh, in the scriptures, we'll see they begin to conspire to have Jesus removed from the situation. And by that, I mean it in a mafia sense of removed from the situation. Uh, they want him sleeping with the fishes, if, uh, if you've ever watched The Godfather or something like that. Um, um, or to, to take a long ride and never come back. They, they want to get rid of Jesus. So here comes Nicodemus. He's intrigued by Jesus, but he's also confused by him. He wants so badly to talk to this man and talk about the things that he has done. And so he comes undercover in the darkness and Jesus meets with him. Here's, here's what, he, what he says. Rabbi. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God. He's buttering him up, right? For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. What else do we know signs by? What, what was the word we, we said last week? We talked about them. John says they're signs. We know them as? Starts with an M. Miracles. They're miracles. There we go. I was going to say starts with an M and ends in miracles. Okay, but uh, uh, anyway, so he... He, he, he says, nobody could be doing those signs. And we, we, John calls them signs because they're pointing somewhere, right? Um, so, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. So, the first thing right off the bat that we have to realize about Nicodemus is though as interested as he is in Jesus, as interested as he is in his identity, Nicodemus is still wrestling with the identity of Jesus. He hasn't figured it out. He hasn't pegged him. He, 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 can't, he can't find the category that belongs to Jesus. And so he's struggling with it. And believe me, that when we first come to know Jesus, and maybe even after you've been uh, around the things of God for years, you may struggle with the identity of Jesus. And that's a good thing. You need to struggle with the identity of Jesus. Because remember, part of our, our understanding of belief is that we, with, uh, to believe means trusting, loyalty, to, uh, that Jesus is who he says he is. And he has come up with it. What, what does Nicodemus tell him he is? What, how does he identify Jesus? As a teacher who is from God. So there's something that we also need to know about Nicodemus, and that is that he's wrestling with the identity of Jesus. His knowledge is correct. Jesus is a teacher from God, but it is incomplete because Jesus is far more than a teacher from God, right? And uh, John chapter 1 tells us that, and Jesus' words uh, will also tell us that. And I want you to know this. That it is very possible for you even to call yourself a Christian and believe things that are correct but incomplete about God. Because one of the things that the book of John does not let us do is just call Jesus a teacher. One of the things that the book of John does not let us do is just call Jesus a good person. Or just call Jesus a prophet. The book of John shows us that Jesus is far more. There's a category that's far wider than that. And it is a category that is a category with God himself. He is with God and he was God, John chapter 1 tells us. And so, Jesus responds to Nicodemus. He says, very truly, we'll hear Jesus say this over and over again. It's like saying, amen, truly, I want to tell you. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born 
Again, Nicodemus, the reason why you're confused as to, about, uh, as to what's going on is because you need something to happen in your life that will open up your eyes and open up your life. You need something to happen in your life that will change everything for you. The reason why you're seeing what I am doing and not connecting the dots is because you're living in darkness and you need to be born into something brand new. And he gives us this important word picture that is uh, is that helps us to understand what happens when we believe in Jesus and that word picture is this born again how many of you heard have heard the term born again right it's kind of anymore uh, becomes so common that it is almost a term of derision at times those born again christians would would mean people who are sold out uh, to christ or something like that so they mean it as a term of derision i think it's a badge we should wear with honor um, born uh, again and this the word for again is a very strange word for again and if you look at several different um, um, translations, it will have a different word in there. I believe the RSV um, says uh, born from, uh, uh, no, I think the RSV says born anew. Um, the NIV will say born from above and the message will say born from above. And sometimes people look at the different translations and goes, how can this be the word of God? Because several other people have, have translated several different words. Which is the word of God? Whenever that happens, what, what's going on is that the Greek, the Greek vocabulary is so much smaller than ours that sometimes words carry with them a whole set of context and meaning. And this is one of those words, anathen, can mean, it, it means again, always means again, but it also has this, this meaning as being from above or from God. So it is again happening from above or from God. And so to be born again is to truly be born from above, to be brand new. Nicodemus, the reason why you can't see what God is up to in my life and the reason why you can't be part of God's kingdom yet is because you have not been born again. It's an incredibly, incredibly important term, and we're going to look at it a little bit more. So Jesus answers, I tell you, no one can enter into the kingdom of heaven unless they're born of both water and the spirit. What in the world is he talking about? He defines it a little bit more. He goes, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives worth, birth to spirit. He says, there are two things that qualify you to be part of the kingdom of God. The very first one is that you have to be physically born. Everybody here been physically born? Anybody? You all have a birth date? I don't know if you have a birth certificate. Uh, maybe check to see if your birth certificate has an expiration date. That's, that's important. But if you've been born, you've got one of the qualifications for being part of the kingdom of God, right? So pat yourself on the back. Everybody just applaud for yourself that you've been born. Way to go. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. You've got us halfway there, right? And so when he says they, they need to be born of water, that's kind of a euphemism or a picture of what, it, what happens during the birth process. The water breaks and a baby is born shortly thereafter. Some people think as well that that is also a connection with baptism in the future, but it seems to be uh, really just a euphemism for, for physical birth. You must be born of the flesh. And it's a pretty radical thing. I don't know if you remember that day. Kind of dark. A lot of pressure. Then all of a sudden bright lights. And it's cold. And people are trying to slap you and clean you. And all that kind of stuff. Birth is a traumatic thing. It's a dramatic deal that happens. That brings us into this world. Birth. And he says you must also be born of the Spirit. And we've already talked about this. 
that John is going to introduce us to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there is something that must happen in our lives that comes directly from God that is not something that you and I do, but something that He does within us. Spirit gives birth to Spirit, and the source of new life is God Himself. And then Jesus says these words, you must be born again. This is an incredibly important, important point. And that is that God wants everyone to be reborn from above. He's not just talking to Nicodemus here. He says, you must be born again. If you want to be part of what God is up to, if you want to be part of his kingdom, there is a threshold that you must cross. There is a decision that has to be made. There is a direction that you have to go and you have to be born again. And this work of rebirth is not something that Nicodemus can do. It has to be done by God, not by our effort, but by his. It's an act of grace. It's a gift from God. Being born again is nothing short of a miracle. But without being born again, Nicodemus will never truly understand or participate in what Jesus is up to. Why has Jesus come? Nicodemus wants to know not only his identity, but what his purpose is. And then we find Jesus lean in a little bit closer. Can you picture the scene? The stars above, they're sitting at a table outside. They're, they're ta- speaking in hushed terms. And Jesus grabs Nicodemus by the, by the arm and says 26 of the most important words that have ever been spoken in the whole world. Can you think of what those words are? They are John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his own one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How many of you re- memorized that as a child? Probably. If you memorize scripture at all, this, this was one of the first verses that you, that you memorized. The words are clear. They're simple. So simple children can understand them. And yet they're profound and concise and they're weighty. They serve as an important threshold to a new kind of life in the person of Jesus. And they tell us so much. First of all, they tell us something about God's nature. That God loves the world. Nicodemus, God doesn't just love Israel, but he also loves Israel's enemies. Not just the faithful, but God loves the unfaithful. God doesn't even just love righteous people, but the whole works. Men, women, children, slaves, free Mess-ups, holdouts, disbelievers, skeptics, sinners, the proud, the bigoted, the oppressed, the impoverished, the wealthy, the powerless, the powerful. He loves them all. You know what? Yes. Way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, But here's the deal. You know that one neighbor that you love? That one that you can loan him the tools and he'll bring it back. Uh, that one that any time that you've gotten in over your head and you need a, an extra hand to, to help you out, this person will come over and help you out. I've got one of those neighbors. I hope you have one of those neighbors. If you don't have one of those neighbors, maybe you need a change in your life. I don't know. But you, you've got uh, one of those neighbors. Guess what? God loves him. But guess what? That neighbor we all have. Can I get a testimony in the house today? The jerk across the street, 
right? The one uh, that is right next door to you, and he is watching every week when you mow to make sure you don't mow, mow a little bit too far over on his property because he thinks that if your wheels touch his property, that means you're laying claim to his property, and he wants you to know where the line is. And he doesn't want you to blow his grass in his direction because, you know, his gra grass clippings have been blessed by God, but your grass clippings may kill his lawn, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about? That person that one time asked to borrow your tool and then you saw it in their garage sale three weeks later, right? That person, God loves that person too. God loves the people from your political party. And do, doesn't everybody, doesn't everybody love the people from your political party? But guess what? God loves the people from the other political party as well. God loves people who are disciplined and have their life together. Can I get an amen? People who do their finances well, people who, you know, exercise, people who eat right. And guess what? God loves screw-ups. People who can't get it right, who over and over again keep doing the wrong thing in the wrong direction and they do it on purpose. God loves those people as well. But there's something that you need to know about God's love. And that, and that is different than the love of the world because the love of the world says, I accept you, I receive you, and I always want you to be just exactly as you are. But God loves us in that he wants to make changes within us. He wants the best for us. And so those words not only tell us about God's nature and that God's nature is love, but also about how God loves the world because he loves it in a very particular way. And he loves the world by giving. See, Jesus didn't start with a diatribe about what God wants from us. Rather, he begins with what God wants for us. He wants to give us something which implies humanity has a need. We lack something we cannot do for ourselves. We have a hole in our hearts that we cannot fill. Eyes that cannot see and hearts that cannot beat. God has something for us. They tell us what God gave. His one and only son. He doesn't give what is easy or cheap. God gave what is most precious. His only son. No fake diamonds here. No last second, second stop at the convenience for, for, uh, uh, store for a gift to pacify us on our birthday. The depth of our need can only be met by the best God has and God's best is his son the author of life the one who is full of both life and light God gave his son for our need it also tells us how we respond we respond with belief in him belief there's that word again that mixture of trust and buy-in that is slathered with loyalty. And Jesus isn't talking about mere mental assent where somewhere in our mind we hit a tipping point and we tip over and go, oh yeah, I think I can believe in that. No, there's a big difference in that kind of belief and a life-changing covenant of trust that reorients our world, helps us see the world and ourselves differently and changes us from death to life. It is a profound trust that in Jesus we've actually found life itself for the very first time. They also tell us about our need so we don't perish. Now listen, for many Christians that word perish is just kind of shorthand for so that you don't go to hell. Can I just tell you that it means way more than that. Let me tell you what it means. I had a plant. Had is the important word. It was given to me by, by Nancy, my sister-in-law. She's here today. She's working uh, with the kids. Say hi to her afterwards. Russell is here as well. Her plant, we were over at her house, and I noticed her plant, and it was lush and healthy and beautiful. I had admired it. I, I mentioned it several times. I thought it was just beautiful. So after I left, 
she pinched off one of the branches and she put it in a cup of water, a glass of water. Over the next several days, it formed roots. Then she planted this brand new start in a nice pot, gave it a few days so that it got rooted, and then she gave it to me. Nancy is so thoughtful that way, isn't she? She's just a giving person. I was so grateful. I took it home. I pictured what it was going to look like, a lush, thriving plant. I put it in a spot that was a good window for light. Then I walked away and I ignored it. I didn't water it. I forgot about it. I stopped thinking about it. I'm so forgetful that way. She grew the thing in a glass of water for crying out loud. So it wasn't very hard to keep alive. But I deprived it of the very thing it needed. Water. I noticed it a couple of days too late. And the song going through my mind, one day too late. You can see people in leisure suits singing it up on the platform. The appearance of a plant was there, but it was now brown, scraggly, gross. It shriveled up, wilted, folded up, and it died. It perished. You see, what Jesus has is what we need and what only he can give. Without it, we have the appearance of life. We still go to the store. We still do our jobs. We still do leisure activities, raise our kids, even water or don't water our plants. But all of us know the feeling. And it starts deep down inside of us and soon spreads until it is suffocating. And it finally hits our brain and we almost have to say it out loud. And maybe you've said it out loud before. There's got to be more to life than this. And there it is. Like my plant. That's a sign you are shriveling up. Dying. Wilting. Perishing. And the trouble is you know it. You see, when you disconnect yourself from the source of light, of life, then you won't have life. Perish. But it also says what we receive instead. So that you won't perish, but have everlasting life. There's another term. That we think is shorthand for something. The Greek phrase is zoane, which means life. Anybody here named Zoe? Anybody here named Zoe? It means life. I saw a little girl in the store and her mama, said, she was so bouncy and active and that kind of thing. Her mama said, her name is Zoe. And I said, but did you know that there's a special word in the Bible that means life that is Zoe? And so she was little miss full of life. And she was. Zoan, Ionain, eternal life. We think it's shorthand for going to heaven someday. And believe me, it's all of that, but it's so much more. You see, it actually is a phrase that describes more than just a long life somewhere else, a special quality of life that only God can give, or rather... The very special life of God living in us. And it begins here and now. Everlasting life is God's new creation. And it's happening in and through us. Even while we're here in the midst of the old broken down creation. And yes, even after we pass from this life. You see, Jesus tells Nicodemus there in the darkness, grabbing his arm, face close to his. All these things you've seen in me, Nicodemus, the very reason why you came to talk to me. That's what God's kingdom is all about. That's what life in God's new age looks like. The sick brought to health. The starved for justice, finally getting the justice they need. Sins washed clean and forgiven. The dark forces of evil finally drawn. 
and back to where they belong, and people who are far from God brought home with a grand celebration. These things I'm doing are signs of life in a dying world, but you can't see it while you're dying too. You need life from above. A life you can't provide. The kind of life that spreads to everything around it. It's life without end. And these words, they also tell us who this life is for. God's love brings salvation to all who believe. I'm sorry. That's not supposed to happen yet. Um... It's for whoever believes. Um, Some of us might be like Nicodemus. You're disciplined. You're steeped in God's word. You're faithful to your, he was faithful to his calling. He's an important person in his community. If that's you, wow, impressive. Impressive. But notice Jesus clearly tells Nicodemus none of that will help him be birthed into the new life of God. None of it. Most of us aren't like Nicodemus. We aren't steeped in the scripture. We have normal jobs or sometimes no jobs. We may or may not be as well as well educated as Nicodemus was. And maybe wouldn't consider ourselves as important as he was. Yet Jesus says whoever believes. Not one track for the Nicodemuses of the world and one track for everybody else, but whoever believes. Belief becomes an important threshold. It becomes the qualifying factor. It becomes us receiving, trusting Jesus enough that what, that uh, who he says he is, is who he is. And what he says he will do is what he will do. Trusting that enough to receive from him what he says he will give us, which is new life. New life. But it's a threshold. An important threshold. Much like one day you were born, the day before you hadn't been born. Everybody was going, we can't wait for this baby to get here. And uh, will this baby ever get here? And your mom was suffering with, uh, with uh, just being very, very pregnant. And uh, all that was going on. And then the very next day, there you were. Wow, it didn't seem like a lot of work on your part. However, something drastic changed. There is a threshold to belief in Jesus, uh, to to a relationship with Jesus, and that threshold is belief, or what other uh, gospels will call faith. That trust in Jesus. Where at one point we're on this side of the threshold and we haven't entered in, and there is a point where we walk across that threshold and we are in new life territory. We're in a place we haven't been before, an expansive room like we've never seen before, a new kind of life. I'm wondering this morning, have you trusted Jesus for that kind of life? Have you experienced the experience of being born from above, being born again, being born anew? Have you experienced the experience of believing in such a way that it changes everything about you? Nicodemus had never experienced That experience. But it's for whoever will come. Did Nicodemus believe? We don't know. We don't know. It's a mystery, but let me just give you a little secret. John's not done with Nicodemus yet. He'll bring him up later in the story. But is he done with you yet? Are you a believer? See, throughout the book of John, people will become believers. People will trust Jesus. People will follow Jesus. There will be people who follow Jesus. Remember in John chapter 1, the the tension was not so much that many people didn't believe, but that some did. Some trusted. But here's the other side of the story. 
throughout the book of John, we'll have some folks who believe Jesus for a little while, and then Jesus will say something hard that is against what they deeply, deeply trust and believe, and all of a sudden, those people will turn their backs on Jesus and walk the other way. Their belief didn't stick. Or there will be others like some of the Pharisees, some of the same class as Nicodemus, who will be so threatened by what Jesus says because he threatens the power structures of our life. And they would be so threatened that they would say, no, not only am I not a believer, but I am the enemy of Jesus. But let me tell you what can't happen in the book of John. Not many people encounter Jesus without making a choice. So where are you at? Where are you at? Could you tell us the story of the day that you crossed that threshold? Could you tell us the story of how you said, you know, Jesus says this and Jesus says that, and I didn't agree with the one thing that he said, but I knew this, that I needed a savior. And I needed the slate washed clean. And I needed to believe. And I crossed the threshold of belief knowing that Jesus would confront me over those things that, uh, that bothered me so, so much about what he said. But I didn't care anymore because I needed God's love. Are you that kind of person this morning? Are you a believer? Jesus would take you by the arm and he would lean in close enough that you could feel his breath on your ear and you could see his smile up close and he would say to you, you know what? The Father loved you so much that he gave his one and only son that Whosoever, and by whosoever I mean you, if you would believe, you would not perish but have everlasting life. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Just this morning, maybe God's talking to your heart. And maybe this feels ridiculous to you. But relationships start in a moment, don't they? One day you don't have a relationship with someone, then the next day you do. But the rela a relationship with Jesus begins as much the same way. Maybe this morning you feel the gentle tug of the Holy Spirit saying, you need to be born from above. You feeling that tug this morning? If that's you, would you, would you help me out so that I can pray for you just by raising your hand? I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about it. I'd, I'd like to pray with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe. Maybe you're embarrassed because people have known you as a believer for a long time. But let's be really honest about it. You can feel the life draining out of you. You haven't put your full trust in Jesus. Like my plant, you're growing more and more dead by the day. You can feel the life being drained from you and you're perishing. And today, you'd like to change that. You'd like to renew your trust in Jesus and say, I am a believer all over again. Maybe that's you. Would you raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you as well. Lord, this morning, they don't need my recognition, but a relationship with you. So however it has to happen, Lord, would you help us to cross that threshold of faith and to realize that we've crossed over into new territory from the death life to life life to new life to new creation, 
And Lord, we're so thankful for that day. For those who are with me that have a memory of that day, Lord, we just celebrate that today. We're so grateful that you stepped into our lives and gave us a newness of life. Lord, we are heartbroken for our friends and family members that just can't see through the darkness. We're still confused. Or perhaps angered and they're running away from you. Lord, would you capture them, capture their hearts, capture their attention and draw them to newness of life in you. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus, the one true sacrifice for us. In his name we pray, amen. Just stand with us. Let's worship together.